Deuteronomy 2. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir. And they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a footbreadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Ye shall buy meat of them for money that ye may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money, that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee, thou hast lacked nothing. And when we passed by from our brethren the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain, from Elath, and from is on Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give thee their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Emims dwelt therein in time past, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakims, which also were counted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. The Horems also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them, and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zered. And we went over the brook Zered. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea, until we were come over unto the brook Zered was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord sware unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the host until they were consumed. So it came to pass, when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou camest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. And the Ammonites call them Zemzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horems from before them. And they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead, even until this day. And the Avims which dwelt in Hezerim, even unto Aiza, the Kaphtorims, which came forth out of Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sion the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it, and contend with him in battle. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee, and the fear of thee, upon the nations that are under the whole heaven. Who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and be in anguish because of thee? And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sion, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn unto the right hand nor to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink, and I will pass through on my feet. As the children of Esau which dwelt in Seir, and the Moabites which dwelt in Ar did unto me, 
until I pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord our God giveth us. But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee, begin to possess, that thou mayest inherit his land. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time, and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. Only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves, and the spoil of the cities which we took. From Aror, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. Only unto the land of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor unto any place of the river Jabbok, nor unto the cities in the mountains, nor unto whatsoever the Lord our God forbade us. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 2, we just basically turn the page over and we begin the next stage in the children of Israel's journeys. It says in verse 1 there, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. Now, in the previous chapter, the rebellion of Israel was clearly highlighted. It talks about how, in verse 46, So abode ye in Kadesh many days according unto the days that ye abode there. And here was a journey which they took from Seir, which we know according to the Bible should have taken them about 11 days, and yet it took many, many years. Now, here from Kadesh to where God commands, speaking unto them in verse 1, that they would go back to Seir, it almost seems like God just wants to highlight a point here unto them. He said, you know, you, you should have taken this journey which lasted 11 days. It didn't because of your rebellion. It was much prolonged. They abode there in Kadesh, and then when that time had lapsed, he says, all right, turn and take your journey again right back to Seir. The Lord here, I believe, is pointing out a lesson. Go take that 11-day 11, 11 journey. See how much easier it is to walk when you're walking with me. Do you see how, how effortlessly... I see you're in a place of rebellion. I see that you've, you've rebelled against me. And yet watch. Turn around and go right back to Seir. An 11-day journey. Do you see how easy that walk was? Do you see how easy that was compared to what it took you to get here in the first place? If you simply follow God, the walk is so much easier. It's shorter, it's more direct. You get to the promised land, you get to the final destination much sooner and often effortlessly by comparison to the way of the transgressor, which is hard, the scripture reads. Now, it says there, as the Lord spake. Now here's wisdom. As God speaks, so ought you to journey, so ought you to travel. When God says turn, turn. When God says journey, journey. As the Lord spake, you often hear Deuteronomy, Moses saying these words, as he spake unto me, so did we. As he spoke, so we turned and took our journeys. And they come to the mount of Seir, and many days begin to compass that mount. And that almost gives me the picture of them just kind of wandering about, mulling over the scenario, thinking long and hard on these things. It's, it's, that, it's that, that wandering of, of meditation upon what you've done. God has them go from this place to this place to this place, all along just compassing the same mount. It's like a nomadic wanderings of sorts. Where are they going? Where, where are they leading to? What, what's their final destination? From the outside looking in, you wouldn't know, except they just keep compassing this mount. What in the world are the people of Israel doing? Well, the Bible says, as the Lord spake, that's what they're doing. 
Unfortunately, they found themselves rebelling, they found themselves complaining and murmuring and all those sorts of things. But the reality is, is that they were doing and being led about by God, not just some nomadic wanderings about. God was purposed in his plans for how he led them about that wood or about that wilderness. Now, we have one verse there that says they compassed Mount Seir many days, and that actually encompasses Numbers 21, a pretty big portion of scriptures, which is led out from that just brief, that just brief description given in Deuteronomy. In Numbers 21, in verse 4, it says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged by the way. So we see that when they begin their journeys in, in surrounding, encompassing this mountain, immediately there in Numbers 21, it reveals that the people were already discouraged. Why? Because of the way. Now, quite often I'll underline the way when I find it in the Old Testament Scriptures. We know Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and so sometimes you can pull out Jesus by type there. They're discouraged. Why? Because they're following after the way, the, the, the truth of God, what God wants them to do. In verse 5, it reveals that the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, and I love this, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now didn't they just get finished saying there is no bread? So why are they now saying there that we loathe this light bread? We don't enjoy this light bread. Our soul... It just despises this light bread. The reality is, is that they had bread. They were just complaining and murmuring and speaking against God, discouraged because they did not have the special pleasantries that they had experienced in a previous life when they were in Egypt. And so God, as he often does, responds as in verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Okay, complaining about bread, God sends fiery serpents. It seems unbalanced until you realize that the bread was sent as a miracle by the hand of God. And so Moses is caught in this position that he often is when leading the people of Israel. In verse 7 it says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. He was faithful to do so. I love Moses' intercession for God's people. You know at one time God had planned to wipe out the people of Israel? And were it not for Moses interceding for them, he would have started fresh with only Moses. Made a great nation out of him. He would have still fulfilled his promise unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but man, that thing would have been set back quite a few thousand years perhaps. But here he starts afresh, and Moses prays for the people. He doesn't serve fresh, rather Moses prays for the people as he often does. Verse 8 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And so God here sends the problem, and then God also, when the intercession of the man of God comes, sends the solution unto the people. And yet he always has a stipulation, doesn't he? Look and live. Look and live, he says to the people. When you behold the serpent, then you shall be healed of the serpent's bite. And so he, he gives them the problem, but then also demands that the people look unto him for the solution. And this happens in our life, I believe. We get into ruts where we start being discouraged with the way. Discouraged with walking with God. Discouraged with the Christian life. And we start to speak against God. And sometimes, and I've had these same thoughts myself, there's no bread here. There's no joy here. We loathe this light bread. There's no water. There's no provision here. We start to lust after the things of the old life, and God sends fiery serpents into our life. He sends problems, struggles, strifes. And quite often when God's intervening in your life and trying to correct you, you know it. There's stuff that happens that couldn't be anything but the hand of God, and God will send that spirit into your heart just kind of pricking you, reminding you, saying, hey, this was for you because of your complaints, because of your murmuring, because of this rut that you're in. 
And the Spirit seems to speak to you through the Word and through impressions upon your innards. Get it right. Look to me. Trust in me. Come back into the fold. Look. And when you look, then you will come out of this rut. I will heal you. I will save you. And so God, because the people said they hate and loathe this provision of food that he has made, they need the brazen serpent to help them. But look what people do. 2 Kings in chapter 18. 2 Kings in chapter 18, if you can get there. God gives a solution, a one-time healing miracle. Look at the serpent and ye shall live. And look what the people do with this serpent. 2 Kings chapter 2, or 2 Kings 18 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his that David, his father, did. Look what the first thing he does is, verse 4. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. And so these people who hated the provision of God in the form of a miracle of bread, literally manna coming to them every morning that they could collect it and eat upon and feast upon angels for to sustain them in the wilderness. They loathe that provision, but when the provision comes after they're murmuring to heal them of the snake bite, now they're going to make that statue into an idol. They take that figure, they take that form of the brazen serpent, and from the time of Numbers 21 all the way up to 2 Kings, they had been worshipping that dumb idol. They had been worshipping that serpent in order to what? Receive blessings and, and, and miracles, perhaps the hand of God. Who knows what they did? It says that they burnt incense unto it. They offered unto it. How Fickle and strange are people that they reject the man and the provision of food that God gives for them as if that's some light thing. We loathe this light bread. Oh, but the brazen serpent. Now this is the cat's meow. This is, this is something cool. We can worship this. We can get behind this. Thank you. And they rejoice and ask God praises for those types of things. Such a strange happening there that happened. But go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and we'll begin in verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 2. I'll read... The, the second verse first. It says, And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. And so that story of Israel and the serpent, all it was encompassed in that time when they were in Mount Seir. Verse 3, it says, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. Verse 4, And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir. They shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a footbreath, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. And so God says, okay, you're going to start traveling, you've been long enough here in this mount. Go northward, you're going to come to the land of the children of Israel, they dwelt on the north side of Seir. They shall be afraid of you. And look what he says. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. It doesn't say take advantage of the fact that they fear you, but take good heed. In other words, mind your conversation among them. Be a blessing unto them. Don't, don't use your fear as an occasion over them or against them. Because God says don't meddle with them. Why? Because this is their land. You are now on their territory. In other words, now you ought to act in a gracious manner while you are here. Whenever somebody invites you into your home, act in a gracious manner. The Bible is giving that indication here. Because not so much as a foot breath would be taken from them. He says in verse 6, He shall buy meat of them for money that you may eat. And ye shall also buy water of them for money that ye may drink. I thought it was a strange thing. I was thinking about it one time. Like, why do we pay money for water? And yet it's biblical here. It's actually recorded that water was such a commodity in the wilderness, of course, that you would actually have to buy it. I suspect that they damned it 
and kept it reserved for themselves. Perhaps they did sell it into bottles for people to consume. They had to purchase the water. They had to purchase the meat as they traveled in to this stranger's land. Of course, they were children of Esau, so they were related loosely. But nonetheless, they were guests here in this land. And not only guests, but they were merchants and had to buy these things. Now look at this unlikely source of provision. Again, God here in this chapter is just highlighting his providing for the people of Israel. The Lord gave unto them these things. And what did he give unto them? Provision from an unlikely source. First of all, we saw the miracle by the manna that was given to them. That light bread that they esteemed it as if it was just some small thing. That, a, that provision came out of nothing. Well, here provision is coming from a people that are afraid of them. And so you would think if they're afraid of them, it would be very hard for them to want to give them things. It would, be, it would be kind of a confrontation when that exchange happened, if that exchange was able to happen. Nevertheless, God commands them, and, and, and I believe gave the blessing, that they would have a soft enough heart to provide the people of Israel what they need. And God is in the business of providing for his people, even in the most unlikely situations. People that are afraid of you, go figure, would end up being the same that would give unto you for your necessities in many cases. Verse 7, it says this, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And quite often we need to be reminded of a verse like that. The Lord has absolutely blessed us in all the works of our hands. If we're doing things in the name of the Lord, if we have the Spirit of God in us, God is there blessing you. He knoweth you're walking through this great wilderness. In other words, He knoweth where you're going. He knoweth what you're doing. He knows the struggles and the trials that you've gone through. And yet the Bible here records of the children of Israel, now apply it to yourself. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And you can think about that right now. There is nothing that you lack even this day. Of what God has provided for you. You have everything that you need. You have more than abundantly above all that you can even ask or think in this life. God has given us so much. Be thankful and remember these things. He's always providing even when we're so ungrateful for it quite often. Go to Psalm chapter 78. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Psalm chapter 78. And this psalm gives a, another kind of overview of the events that we've been, we've been reviewing lately. In the last two chapters of Deuteronomy. And as you read this, you're going to find God just talking about how he blessed and provided and gave. And how the people turned back and tempted and rebelled. And yet he's still in the business of providing for even ungrateful people. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 13, it says, He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night was a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. All these miraculous things God's done. And they sinned yet more and more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lusts. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And just based on the verses previous, the answer is yes, he can furnish a table in the wilderness. When there is famine, God can give you a feast. When there is poverty, God can make you rich. When you are in need, God can give you all that you could ever desire. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? They said, speaking against and tempting the Most High. The answer is a most certain and resounding yes. Verse 20, it says, Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Yes, the answer is. Verse 21, Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven, 
and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full, and yet they're still in unbelief, though they had seen so many great and wonderful miracles. Don't be an unbelieving as these people of Israel. Look to these examples. They're written for your admonition. Upon whom the ends of the earth are come, these things are our examples. Look to these and understand. If God can divide the sea so that these people walked on dry land, surely he can care for your needs and putting food in the fridge. If God provided that out of the rock bust forth great as a river, depths of waters, certainly he can pay your rent. Certainly he can maintain your health. He can do all these things. Don't tempt him by bringing your unbelief as a sacrifice before him. Give him your faith. Give him your trust. Look to these verses. Look and live as they did to the Old Testament brazen serpent. But don't make an idol of the solution when it comes. The truth is, yes, God can provide, will provide, wants to provide, desires to give you all things in order to sustain you. Why? Because he loves you and because he has a job for you. And he also doesn't want to have anything but glory when he stands before the nations. If God's people are always just beaten down, trodden down, hungry, starving, without anything, God's not going to get any glory. But in the times when things are the toughest, that's when God's people will shine forth as a light. And we will see great miracles provided for us. And I believe that. Go to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. One example from the prophets. 1 Kings 17. And in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, the Bible records him as a man of like passions. Like as to us, just a normal guy, Right? Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not dew nor rain these years, but according unto my word. There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He makes the promise before the king. According to my word, I'm praying it even now, there won't be rain. What's he calling for? A famine. And the word of the Lord came unto him, verse 2, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be, look at this verse, I love it. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Unlikely provision, right? A ravenous bird, an unclean bird. A bird that would normally scavenge and tear up any provision that it would bring to a person long before it would ever think of doing such a thing. Brings the food. Is commanded by God to feed the prophet by that brook in a time of famine and a time of drought. And here he does this once. It says in verse 5, So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. There's our wisdom. There's our understanding to do according to God's word. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. There's prepping for you in the Christian life. People talk about, I'm going to be a prepper. I'm going to have tons of cans. I'm going to have tons of wheat and barley. I'm going to have tons of provision stocked up and stored up so that I can survive when the stores are empty, when famine hits our country. You're not going to be able to stock up enough provision to last three and a half years of tribulation, let me tell you. But, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Amen, he can. And so count on God. Follow the word of God. Believe in God so that if there is a famine and there is a drought, he can take you, put you by a source of water and bring you bread, bring you angels' food. Send a raven to bring you what you need. This is Christian prepping. We prep by prayer. We fall on our knees and ask for God's will. We beg him to continue to provide for us what we need. And even when we're lacking, we trust that he is going to fill the void. Verse 8, there's another example. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth unto Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow, a widow woman to, or widow woman there, 
to sustain thee. And there's another example. And we've read this, that she has not but a handful of meal. Was going to prepare with a little oil enough cake to just satisfy her and her son, and then they were going to die. Elijah says, prepare me a cake first. Enjoys the cake. And that meal did not fail. And that oil did not run dry. God continued to provide by the most unlikely source. And so when the news is scaring you, talking about shortages and talking about how the grocery stores are going to be empty and void of meat and, and void of water is going to become an issue. We're going to not have cleanliness enough and we're not going to have enough food. Look to examples like this and trust that God is able to provide for your every need. The Lord gave unto them, just believe that he can give unto you of the same. Don't doubt, don't fear, only believe. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and in verse 8, we'll read down to 13. Deuteronomy 2 and verse 8. And when we pass by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elath and from Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way into the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Emims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but Moabites called them Emims. And it continues on and says, The Horums also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them. When they had destroyed them from before them, they and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto him. Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zered. And we went over the brook Zered. This is again overviewing the travels. And he's again amongst another people who God says, I'm not giving you of their land. Distress them not. Rather be, be, be just passing on through. Go over the brook Zered. And God's people did exactly what was expected of them. God's care and provision does not waver. He continues to maintain his people and to care for them. Go in verse 14, it says, And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zerad was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord swear unto them. And while we see that God is providing all along the way those thirty-eight years, his judgment does not Fade, does not waste away, does not slumber. God promised that this people would waste away in the wilderness. He sustained them for 38 wonderful years, perhaps. There would have been many memories and, and joys and rejoicing and blessed times. And generations are born. These would have saw perhaps grandchildren born and enjoy that. But God says in verse 15, For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from among the hosts until they were consumed. Because of their disobedience, God had to fulfill his judgment against them. His hand against them in that they would not survive past those 40 years and see the promised land. So God here cares and provides for us in their lifetime. But he does not waver from the judgment which he pronounces when he does so. Verse 16, it says, So it came to pass, when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. When thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, again, here it says, Distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land for, of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old times, and the Ammonites called them Zemzumims, a people great and many and tall, and da 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 da, da continues on talking about them. So here God again separates <laughs> another land which would not be theirs. It would not be theirs to possess. He's dividing up the land and he's basically giving them a tour of who their neighbors are going to be. And then he brings this up. And also, there were giants in this land, okay? So, it refers to them as being great, as being many, and as being tall. 
Genesis chapter 6, briefly, we'll go there. Genesis chapter 6. Because we can't read about something so cool as the giants and just leave it alone. So in Genesis chapter 26, we're going to find the first references to these giants. It says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So here we have a time when men were multiplying, the face of the earth was beginning to be covered, and it says here that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. In verse 3 it says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with, and look at this, it says, Man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in a hundred and twenty years. I believe that's indicating the span of time before the judgment that is being highlighted here falls. And that's the flood of Noah's time. Now as you read down, it says in verse 4, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, okay, we're reading over in Deuteronomy about the after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Okay, so three times it says there in that context that God's not going to strive with men. There's giants when the sons of God and the daughters of men came together. That's giving us a time frame. There's children that are born which became mighty men. The same which were of old, men of renown. That means they're well known. That means they're famous. That means they're leaders, perhaps. Governmentally and likewise. Verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man from whom I have created from off the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Seven times in the context of those seven verses in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about men being judged. Grieve me that I made man. Man that I have created. Man and beast will be destroyed. The wickedness of man is the problem here. That's indicating that the sons of God, daughters of men, the giants that were born unto them, are simply but men. You can't extract that from the context of what we're reading here. Why do I bring that out? Because there's all sorts of weird theories, and if you spend any time on YouTube, type in giants in the Bible, you're going to find all sorts of weird and strange, abnormal, out-of-this-world teaching that's going to lead you everywhere but the Scriptures. But I believe what the Bible teaches here is simply that these are men, big men, of course. Great men, many men are found at this time, right? But what happens in, let's say, like, a, you know, if, if you spend any time down in, like, the Norwich area, you got big, burly farming men that are making big, burly farming men to, to the generations after them. And I believe that's what you saw here. Sons of God came into the daughters of men. In other words, Christian men, the sons of God, came in unto or married the daughters of men, worldly women, and it created this problem, which was in verse 5, the wickedness of men became great. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, evil continually. This isn't some sort of strange science fiction teaching, but rather just a teaching that you ought not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers because you're going to create mighty men, men of renown that are going to cause all sorts of wickedness to reign in this world. When cleanness touches dirtiness, the clean doesn't make the dirty clean. The dirt always affects the other. And that's what happens when you're unequally yoked in a marriage, in a relationship, is that the Christian is almost never benefited by yoking up with the unbeliever. In fact, the uncleanness of the unbeliever will most definitely taint the believer. Go back to Deuteronomy I just wanted to touch on that briefly because it says giant so many times in this passage of scripture. And in the next couple of them, we'll see it at the same. I don't know if I'll deal with it further than that. 
But after here, we see these nations establishing, settling. We see the men of war finally consumed, as was promised in the previous chapter. They begin then to establish the land of Israel that was promised unto them. Verse 24, the Bible says, Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. So God here is charging them. Now that he, they start to see who their neighbors are, he says, okay, here's the fourth neighbor I'm about to mention. Sihon, king of the Amorites. He's the king of Heshbon. Begin to possess his land. Contend with him. In the context of what we see here, you can apply this to the Christian life. Land, good ground, is always victory in the Christian life. We need to get the victory. We need to press on into higher ground. The Bible says in the New Testament, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We're to contend in the realm of our faith and in our belief. And so when the Bible gives us an example of the people being charged to go into that land, begin to possess it, contend with the inhabitants there, that's by extension and by secondary application, gives credence and, and gives, gives charge to the Bible-believing Christian to go and take good ground in your life. Go and conquer sins. Go and conquer lusts of the flesh. Get victory over those things. Earnestly contend for this faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says there in verse 24, um, contend with him in battle. Verse 25 says, This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Christian life is about going and conquering and overcoming obstacles, challenges, fears, doubts. We need to be overcomers of those things. Earnestly contending in this faith and for this faith. Get to the good ground. Get to the promised land in our lives. Gain victory over your flesh and over your sins and over your lusts and over the challenges that this world places before you. The world ought to be fearful of the Christian. We ought not retreat. In our lives as believers, as a church, we ought not to be fearful and afraid in any situation. Verse 25 says, I will begin, and I, got, I believe God did this in our lives, I will begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon all nations. The reason why people hate us so much out in the world, the reason why the whole world is bent on destroying the Christian worldview, the Christian mindset, and ultimately the Christians, is because they're afraid of us. Because they know that, as Christ commanded and promised, all power was given unto him, and then he says, so send I you. And so we have that same power that Christ has if he's in us and we're in him. If we're walking in the Spirit, then there's nothing that can be withheld from us. That's a lot of power. The government tries to act like they have a lot of power. All power has been given to Christ, and he says, so send I you. you know, we got to understand that we are the most powerful creatures upon this earth right now. And that's what the world is afraid of. They are afraid. Satan is afraid. The world is afraid of an assembling church more than they are of nuclear bombs. More than they are of weapons of war. More than they are of the coronavirus. This here, the assembly of God's people, is more dangerous to the working of the devil than anything. Than any kind of political uprising, political movement. A bunch of believers praying together, laboring together, working together, has been given all power in heaven by the command of Christ as he says, so send I you. So we need not doubt and fear or worry. We need to understand that God is beginning to put the fear of us upon this world and upon the nations. He's beginning to put the dread of us upon this world and upon these nations. They will tremble in anguish because of even one praying believer. Look at the case of Elijah. Didn't he pray that it would stop rain? He put a whole nation on its knees in famine and in drought by one prayer. He was just a man like us, like passions, and yet he prayed. We have power 
The world ought fear us. Don't fear a thing, Christian, except God. Remember, in the case of Esau, just a few passages or a few verses before, in verse 5, it says that the fear of them caused them to bless the people of Israel, provide for their needs. And we can all now look at this case of Sion and what the fear of them did to him. Verse 26, it says, And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying. And he's about to give to Sion the same thing that he's given to three nations before. And that's this statement, verse 27. Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn unto the right hand or to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet. It says in verse 29, As the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and the Moabites, which dwelt in Ar, did unto me, until I shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord our God giveth us. And so the reactions to the same statement are about to show. One provided what the God's people needed in order for them to get through. Willingly, they gave what was needed, sold the food, sold the water, the provision was made. God's people were blessed and taken care of. Now the same words, the same charge is given unto this Sihon, king of Heshbon. And what is his response? Look there in verse 30. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate before us. His heart obstinate that he might deliver him unto thy hand as appeareth this day. So there we have in verse 30 a revelation that Sihon would not help. But it also shows that this very thing was of God. So God, as he promised begins to put the fear and dread of the people of Israel upon Sihon, and his reaction is, uh -uh, I'm not helping you out. Verse 31 says, And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee. Begin to possess that thou mayest inherit the land. Now remember, when the world fights against you, with that hardened spirit, with that obstinate heart, and obstinate means stubbornly refusing to change opinion or course of action despite being persuaded. Have you ever met somebody that is obstinate, that is stubbornly just refusing to change their opinion, completely refusing to change their course of action despite the fact that you are persuading them? We, reach, we come into that all the time, don't we? With family members, with, with, with strangers when we're out soul winning and ministering to people. When that happens, scripturally, we have verification here. That while we think like we're being pushed against, we think like we're not getting anywhere because the world is fighting against us, unbelieving family members are fighting against us, that hardened spirit, that obstinate heart is just constantly pushing against us. We're not going to get what we think we should get or what God has promised according to all of the situations before. Scripturally, this could very well, that obstinate heart, that, that hardened spirit, this could be God beginning to give you the victory. Isn't that what he says? Sihon says, no, nope, I'm not helping you out. God says that this is me delivering him unto your hands. Behold, I have begun to give Sion and his land before thee. Begin to possess that thou mightest inherit this land. What is his charge? He says you're traveling, you're marching, you're going forward. You've passed through three nations. You've said these same words. Give me food. Give me money. I'll buy it. I'll tread lightly on your land. And they provided for you. Now you've said these same words unto Sion. He wants nothing to do with it. But wait, I'm preparing to give you everything. That belongs to Sihon. Quite often the people that are fighting the hardest against you are the ones that you are one day going to miraculously and, and severely overcome. 
Begin to possess the land. The enemy does not stand a chance. Look at verse 32. Then Sion came out against us, he and all his people, to fight against Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us. And we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones in every city. We left none to remain. Only the cattle we took for a prey to ourselves and the spoil of the cities which we took. He goes and asks, hey, can we buy something for you for money? God hardens his heart in order that God would provide everything that they possess. The same charge came forth. Give us, help us, sustain us, and the world obliged. But this time they didn't, and God still allowed for them to walk right over, take from Sihon, and inherit all of the things. God again providing some miraculous way, some unexpected way, some unlikely source of provision comes upon a praying and God-fearing and God-following people. Verse 36, from Aurora, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, from the city, which is by the river. And it lists all of these places that the children of Israel did not inherit. Why? Because that last part of the final verse there, verse 37, says, Nor unto whatsoever the Lord our God forbade us. You know, the only thing that is not available unto God's people is what he forbids you. And God's provided so many things for us. And as we read through this passage, we can just find time and time and time again the Lord giving unto them, the Lord providing unto them, Him carrying them through, having nations sustain them, having provision come before them without even hesitation. When finally one nation says, no, we're not giving this unto you. I'm not going to provide you food as you pass and tread lightly across my land. God puts the fear and dread into the hearts of the people such that that hardened spirit, that obstinate heart, results in a complete and devastating fall by the enemy of God. We need to not wander 40 years in the desert, wasting away, thinking that God isn't helping us. God's not there caring for us. We need to not doubt. God just showed us a, a wonderful picture here. Chapter 1. They're doubting, they're unbelieving, they're rebelling. You turn the page, and oh, 40 years had passed previous, and then that first verse shows us they took that journey back. They had revelation of the fact of that. That could have been an easy trip, just 11 days. But here they compass about 40 years. All those rebels fall as God is showing the rebels what he's going to do throughout that time. And what's he going to do? Provide for the young ones. Provide for the up-and-comers. Provide for the people that were promised they could go into the land until that last mighty man died off, seeing only a glimpse of what God was about to promise. And then, look at this, without a mighty man, after they had all died off, right? Without that first generation of great warriors, they are able to great have this great military battle in which they possess the king of Heshbon. All of his things, all of his land. Sihon comes out against them to fight, and God's people overcome. What's the lesson here? we got to believe God the first time, because that type of victory would have happened in Deuteronomy chapter 1 if they would have just trusted God and did according to his will and followed along as God provides here. Look at their story. is isn't that complicated. They went, they asked, it was provided for them. They went, they asked, it was provided for them. Finally, that last remnant of the unbelievers dies off. They went, they ask, they're rejected. Certainly there was doubts and concerns and worries. All we've ever known is having provision made from these people. And then again, an unlikely provision is made. Just like the manna. Just like the rock that gushed out. Just like a raven bringing food by the brook. The provision is this, that they are going to overcome a great and mighty king and take all of his things. Begin to possess it, God says. Begin to take what I have given you. Contend in battle. And God is there to sustain them and to show them that, hey, I'll give you whatever except for the things that I have forbidden you. You can have it all except for the things that I'm withholding for somebody else. 
somebody that I've promised something else to, somebody that I've, I've, I've given their land for you. But look, there's a promised land awaiting. And for you, that's victory in your life. That's, that's your struggles overcoming them. That's just putting food on the table. Whatever your problem and struggle and fears and worries are, give them to God. Just trust Him to care for you. Because this here is another example of just what happens when you trust and believe and lean on God. Believe Him the first time. Believe Him every time. Don't go wasting about, wandering around in the wilderness. But when God says, just say yes, Lord. When he asks, just say, I will. Here am I, send me. And that's how the Christian can have victory, can overcome, can have success in this life, in this journey.